Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Oh, good day, how are you going? Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm your host, Phil Tarrant, and wherever you're tuning into this, whether it's across the marvels, that is social media, I think we're on TikTok and YouTube and all <laughs> over the joint these days, uh, it's hard not to find us, and you're joining well over 150,000 Australian property investors that tune into this show every single month, which I get a real kick out of. Um, knowing that, uh, number one, that there's information like this available to people so they can make more informed investment decisions. But number two, that people are relying on this information uh, to help them shape and frame the way in which they invest in property. So it's my job to make sure I try and cover all the bases I possibly can at any given time uh, with a view towards who our typical audience uh, or listener is. And, and for many people, they're just kicking off in property and property investment, which is cool. It's a great way to create wealth. Uh, something which has been a great enabler to me over a decade of investing in property to to create a portfolio, which now sort of is quite big. Uh, and I sort of share some of the details in and around that, particularly the portfolio that we created for the purpose of this podcast, the Smart Property Investment Show um, and the podcast, or sorry, the portfolio that we've been uh, talking about for, for over a decade, um, uh, sort of buying, investing and selling properties uh, right across Australia, primarily uh, Sydney, Brisbane, and also in Melbourne. Uh, but there's another aspect to, to property investment, which is often overlooked. And we don't usually talk too much about it on this show because we, we try and detach ourselves in many ways from uh, some of the more sensationalized stuff you'll see on TV around property investment and property. And what I'm talking about there is like location, 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 or, um, uh, or the block, which is very sort of made for consumer TV. It's all about sort of soft furnishings and the drama of property uh, and, and, and all the personalities of people connected in with it. But um, a big part of property investment is making sure that you can maximise the value of your asset as much as possible for the purpose for which you're investing in it with. And investment properties come in many shapes and sizes um, uh, for many people right now. Um, and you would have seen it on the Fast 50 report, which came out recently, they're buying investment property in Perth. Uh, I think 50 of the top, sorry, 25 of the top 50 suburbs were in Perth and, and you get into that market for about 400 grand. Um, there's other ways in which Australians invest in property, commercial property. I talk a lot about that, I uh, invest in commercial property. There's also people that invest in short-term rental accommodations and they're looking for a hybrid of uh, a property which can be an investment property which they can generate income from, but also potentially get the benefits of using that as a second residence uh, or, or, a, or a holiday home for themselves. That's something that which grew in rapid popularity uh, over the can COVID pandemic. Uh, it is still very popular. Um, certain local governments are now trying to police um, the availability of short-term rental accommodation in Australia or what's available on Airbnb. I note, for example, in Byron Bay, which had a proliferation of this sort of stuff, the government's clamped down now and saying you can only rent out these properties for certain men of um, uh, nights per uh, year. And that has changed and shaped the way in which or the performance or the economic performance of these properties. So horses for courses, but whatever you're investing in, you want to maximise it as much as possible. Typically, we talk about the nuts and bolts of it, how many bedrooms, um, uh, where is it located, what the rent is, but there's other aspects to it which can really shape the performance of your property. And that's what it looks like and what is it like internally and how are you using the best use of space, how you make it a usability, livability of that particular uh, asset, whether it's a, a, an investment property in Perth or a short-term rental accommodation, um, Airbnb property. So I'm going to get stuck into that today. It's a bit beyond my pay grade, this sort of stuff. I, I talk a lot about buying and selling property, but uh, I must admit uh, my skills as an interior designer or a stylist or, or someone that can really look through or see the woods through the trees and actually understand how you use the property is a bit beyond me. So I brought Jace Campbell into the studio. I know Jace, Jace worked with me on a, a particular project, uh, shaping um, some uh, short-term rental accommodation uh, last year. He's from Found by Jace Campbell. Once upon a time, he used to work uh, for, a, for a large organization that most people would be familiar of who creates really good furniture um, as uh, uh, an in-house interior designer, senior designer there. And he only recently went out by himself and created his own business, which I thought was an exceptional idea. <laughs> And I think one of the projects he worked on for me was one of the first ones he ever did. So uh, uh, he's going to tell you what's and all what I'm like to work with, uh, which I'm sure is pretty tough. But Jace, good to see you, mate. Thank you, Phil. So, so we've um, spent a fair bit of time together uh, over um, a period. I think we first caught up 
but between when we first caught up, when we we're looking for someone to help shape a vision for how we're going to build out this this short term rental accommodation, which we could also use as a family, mm-hmm. versus getting it all done and dusted was yep. probably about ten months. Yeah, it wasn't least, a short project. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't want to say probably a year. It was yep. a year. Yeah, from start to finish. How frustrating was I work to work with? Uh, no, actually, you're, you're pretty you can, easy. Yeah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the great thing with working with you in Victoria was that you're very honest. And as an interior designer, you really rely on a client just telling you honestly how they're feeling, what they're liking, what they're not liking. Uh, if they're going to hold back or hold their cards, you can't perform as well. Uh, an interior design, a good interior designer, uh, has to be a great listener and there has to be like open transparency in dialogue and communication at all times, because the, the interior designer is like any trade on site. You, you want a good builder, you want good electricians, you want good, um, everything really. And we're no different where you could think of us like a skilled trade on site. We're there to help you. We're there to get a goal. Um, and that is to create an interior that surpasses your own expectations and obviously optimizes any investment because all property is an investment, whether you're staying there for um, the foreseeable future or whether your uh, goal is to maybe uh, sell it or rent it in a year's time a good interior designer will listen to your brief and plan around, as you said, on the project we worked with, you were looking for uh, accommodation use, but also a place to go with your family on weekends. So it had a dual purpose. That's all part of the brief. Uh, It's important that I hear that Mm. and plan holistically around that. Uh, There's a lot of work that goes involved with it. Um, I think it was probably your first time using an interior designer. Yeah, I typically have done it myself, uh, hence the reason why I was quite popular at IKEA and fantastic <laughs> furniture. So I thought this time around we actually needed to get someone that knew what they're doing. And, and I'm happy you've framed it that way, Jason. That is that you need to view interior design as, as another trade. Yes. You know, yep. A lot of people get absorbed and obsessed with the kitchen, the bathroom, um, you know, the, the, the building materials that you use. So it's just part of a sequence of professionals 100%. to get you to the best outcome that yep. you want. And it's often overlooked. Like most people think, I can do it myself. I've got a really good eye for detail. I don't need to pay whatever an interior designer costs. Yes. But it can make all the difference because if you get an interior designer in at the right time, what I've learned through this process is not just what something looks like or how you use it. It's the, the mechanics of how it changes the way in which the utility of a property operates. And yeah. that was the that was the probably the key thing for me because if you design things wrong, they lack utility and they become a nuisance and it, it, it can, you know, compromise the livability of a place, but it can also compromise the value of a place as well over the long term. So it's yep. really important. Absolutely. I never really thought I've re- never really thought as an interior designer as a tradesperson, but, but yeah, well, you sort of are. In your yeah, your, in your case, you had purchased the property and it was already built. Mm. So that's probably uh, less likely. In most cases, we will work with a client that's building or is about to begin building or has just started. And so another component of our job is to project manage and work in alongside trades and builders and have a really good rapport and equally good with a bit of luck uh, communication with those trades because um, as a building's going up, as you as you well know, you've built properties before or renovated, things can change. Um, and one of the reasons why interior designers are engaged is because we handhold a lot and we're there to help guide that process. It's not just about, you know, what it's going to look like in the end and the furnishings that go into the finished room. Uh, we can catch things as they're unfolding. We can often catch mistakes as they're happening. Uh, so it is a really smart investment if you are going through a build or large scale renovation to have an interior designer on board as soon as possible. Um, or you bring them in at, uh, as you did with the build finished, Mm. but as you found, you're then going to have to wait for up to 10, maybe 12 months in some cases for those rooms to be really effectively furnished properly if there's not a time restraint. Uh, so obviously if you'd said we need this finished in two months, that has a huge domino effect and 
uh, impact on what the end result's actually going to be because you've now eliminated bespoke furniture, um, customized furniture, everything will be off the rack. So it all comes down to that initial brief and what is your own expectation? What are the requirements of your lifestyle? How are you wanting to use this property? Um, how quickly? What are the lead times? What are the budgets? That's another mm. big, big component. Well, yeah, and, and, and budgets can certainly be a different end of the spectrum. But again, it comes down to the purpose of the utility of the property and, and, and all property being an investment. So, you know, if you're doing a big renovation for your own occupier home, you've obviously got different outcomes you want, but largely the principles will be the same. But for our audience of property investors, they could be doing development. It could mm -hmm. just be a, a duplex development, more small townhouse development, or they might be building, you know, 20, 30, 40 um, uh, apartments on, on, on a block of land uh, and or renovating a home that they've seen potential in uh, and they're looking to get an upside as the investment pill for it, whether it's to refinance it and draw the equity out or to increase its rentability. Um, so it's important. You've got to get this right. And, yep. and a lot of people try and do it themselves. Um, but I would say back to Jace's point around this being a trade, it's probably a trade where you don't want to scrimp on because you don't usually see what's inside of a wall or the construct of a property, but what you do see is the the, vis the visible appeal of a place. So yep. interior design is probably the most visible aspect of any any yeah. build, construction or, or renovation. So I think there's a bit of a, a misnomer or a disconnect between what is a interior designer versus a property stylist. So yep. what I understand are two very different things. Yeah. And I, I also think there's a misconception around interior designers that's a little old fashioned. I think there's still a lot of people out there, despite the shows that you've mentioned, it is very popular. Uh, that still discard using an interior designer because they may think that it's too expensive or it's beyond them or they may just not have any experience with one and don't actually know what an interior designer will be able to do for them. And I really encourage those people to um, kind of get over that and engage with an interior designer. You don't have to go through the whole gamut with them. You can just like any other trade or any other business, you can inquire with that designer and, and have a conversation around your property, your investment, what you're thinking. And there is a myriad of services we provide that can help you. You don't have to engage an interior designer to do a, a full turnkey property. You can engage an interior designer to come over and consult on what works may need to be carried out in terms of um, selling my property or renting my property, uh, or I'm going to live in my property for two years before I go overseas, you know, an interior designer will always look at a property very differently to the way you do, who's brought it for a specific reason. They kind of look from the outside with fresh eyes. And because we go into so many properties and we deal with so many people, we have a very broad spectrum, quick way of analyzing a property and really understanding what it's lacking or um, simple ways that can often be really inexpensive, cheap even, to instantly create great fast change within an existing property. Uh, and I'll give you an example of something like that. Several years ago, I rented a, a property in here in Sydney, a studio and the kitchen was refurbished by the owner whilst I was living there. And they did what everybody did in the building. There was one particular company that redid all the kitchens and they were the cheapest quote. They specialized in kind of cookie cutter, rent specific kitchens, white, um, cheap appliances. So they got that company in and, and did this small kitchen. And when it was finished, I said to the property manager, you realize that if they had made this, they had a little bar fridge in mm. this kitchen. If they'd made this allocation for this fridge six centimeters wider, it would have given any renter in the future the option of buying their own washing machine and putting in a laundry, which it didn't have. And that instantly increases the value of your rent. You've got an internal washing machine, which none of the other, or a lot of the other apartments, particularly in Potts Point where I lived at the time, um, Many of them don't have internal laundries. They've got communal laundries. And to have a washing machine in a studio is such a luxury. Mm. And it instant, like, it's not a question. You don't have to wait for the next 
rate rise to put your rent up by $20, you can charge quite a bit more for your studio per week because it's now got an internal laundry. Ceiling fans are another example. A lot of properties in Sydney don't have adequate cooling. You don't have to put an air conditioner in, but if you don't have ceiling fans, there's no airflow and that renter um, is sitting there suffering in heat. They're really inexpensive things that if you actually just, you're redoing the kitchen anyway. So if you just thought about it a little bit harder or didn't just give it over to this random kitchen manufacturer to do, they're not interested in maximizing the value of your property. You've got to take a little bit of ownership if you're not engaging a designer. And I, th I think that just sort of further amplifies the fact that if you don't want to do those things, you don't have time to look at the kitchen you're installing, or you really just want to have a hands-off approach, engage an interior designer yeah. because that's what they're there f for you to do. They will catch those things and say to you, make that, that allocation six centimetres wide, you've got an internal laundry. Yeah. And you, you just, it's one of those unknown unknowns. If, if you have no connectivity with interior design, uh, you're just not going to look for those things and no. therefore you're going to miss it completely. So there's about the, 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 the cascading application of being able to bring in a professional uh, to give you a, a second set of eyes and what would possibly be years of experience to help you maximise the value of your investment. Now, there's many different ways you can you can quantify the value of your, your investment property. How much is it worth? It's a really good, easy way to do it. How good is it to live in? Um, how do you actually generate more rent from it by using the internal space more effectively, all these things work out. And, and, and I do like the point around thinking of a, um, a, an interior designer as a tradesperson, as in part of your ATEM. We talk about accountants, we talk about mortgage brokers, we talk about buyer's agents, you talk about all these different related property professionals. No one's actually saying an interior designer can sometimes help you turn a two-bedroom house into a three-bedroom house yeah. through a really smart view of it. And you're instantly going to increase the value of the property as a result of that. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. And welcome back. It's Phil Tarrant. I'm the host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Thanks for joining us. As we talk through interior design, I've got Jace Campbell in the studio. He's from found by Jace Campbell. I worked on a project with Jace uh, a little while ago. And uh, I must admit, he challenged a lot of my assumptions around property um, styling and particularly interior design. Uh, uh, I've gone through the path before trying to furnish places. This particular project, I went, it's a bit beyond me. Uh, but the outcome we got by using Jace, I think, would be completely different if we tried to do it ourselves. And even on the smaller stuff, and what I did learn, Jace, was that there's a big difference between sort of hard furnishings and sort of layer, yep. layering and soft furnishings. I never yep. really had a real appreciation for the yes. latter. Yes. Like I, I got sort of nice sofas and that, but but in isolation... Yeah, they really lose their appeal. Like the, the whole concept of laying layering, yeah. which is something I was like, "Wow, it actually makes a big difference." So I remember yeah. when getting original quotes from you going, ah, "Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. No worry about it." You know, it's often one of the things that trip people up. They like home decor and layering, is, as you rightly call it, is something that a lot of people in a presentation for turnkey or almost turnkey, they can't quite understand until. And you've been through this holistic journey now, so you can kind of. Um, understand it. Without those things, uh, it's a big gap between a home feeling like a display home and a home that feels like someone lives here and it looks great. Mm. Like it looks really, I, I want to curl up on that sofa. That's what layering does. It's all of the, it's not clutter. It's not bric-a-brac. It's not all those things that you might uh, go to in your head. It's um, dressing coffee tables with really cool interesting coffee table books that you kind of actually want to go over and open up because they've kind of caught your eye or a, 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 an amazing tactile throw on the end of a sofa that you actually want to touch. That's what layering, good layering is. It's buying a beautiful four poster bed, but actually just spending a little bit more and having the right linen and cushions on that bed. So you just kind of want to throw yourself on that bed and, and um, curl up. So, so the, the art then for a really good interior designer is is to spark an emotional connection with one hundred percent the 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 property. Yeah, uh, and and that emotional connection can be many different things. If you're selling your property, you want to present it the best possible light to persuade someone to pay as much as they possibly can to yep. it. Or if you're um, uh, designing a place for for rent, you want to be able to 
capture the essence of living there so someone will have a greater appetite for spending yeah. money on renting it but yep. then also visualising themselves in it yes. and therefore hopefully creating longer-term stickier tenants which yep. are more valuable for you. So it's really... It sounds uh, a little cliche, doesn't it, Like when you talk about it? But how many of us have heard somebody say, I brought this house, I had this emotional connection to it. When, as soon as I saw it, I knew mm. these sorts of stories you often hear about whether you're a property investor or whether you might just have one, one or two homes. It's always this uh, connection that a property has to you. And it can just be a feeling. I, I think a good interior should be something that you don't actually kind of know how to pinpoint why you love it so much. You yeah. just do. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, definitely, definitely emotional. It is emotional. And, and hence the reason why if you're selling a property, a lot of the times the agent will say, let's style it. And I guess it, this is a bit of the difference between property styling mm. and, and interior design, but styling being we need people to imagine themselves inside yeah. of it. And a lot of people get offended when, when they sell a property, um, and they say, look, let's let's get rid of all of your furniture, which you think is really, really nice, and yep. let's put this other furniture in. They go, oh, what's wrong with that? This furniture is fine. Yep. They go, no, just, it's just not, and yep. it's too much of it. Yep. And let's, let's repackage and reposition for the purpose of maximising its value. So that's yes. one application of it all. But that interior design versus property styling. Like interior design, to be fair, is that, a, is that a, a step up? It's more of just the... Style. It's, a, it's about the maximising the utility of. I'm just yeah. trying. To, like, if I was a first year property, uh, if I was a first year interior design university uh, student, and I went to interior design 101, mm -hmm. what would they tell me? It is. Uh, basically, it's dependent on what what it is that you're acquiring at that point. So, a property stylist is usually an inter uh, a qualified interior designer, but the reason they're engaged is quite different and it's generally because someone's selling their property. It's imminently going to happen or they've decided at least that they're going to sell and their job is to come in usually with much smaller lead times uh, and a property stylist will have typically access to catalogued furniture. They might have a small warehouse somewhere where it's more readily available and they'll put a little look together for you and that's it in a nutshell, though. Uh, it's also dependent on a brief. Some people have longer. Some people have much shorter. And it's like interior design. If you have a really short uh, time period for a property stylist, then you need to accept the fact that they're going to have what they have and they'll need to make the best of what that looks mm. like. It's not going to probably feel um, refined. It'll be they've had these four sofas. This one's the best that kind of thing. So the more time, the more um, grace you can give a property stylist like an interior designer, the better the outcome is going to be because they'll have more time to source items. There might be other things coming back to their warehouse or they'll be able to, um, you know, even uh, bespoke something potentially uh, that's specific for the property. But their job is quite different because they're just looking to uh, do a basic, more basic version of kitting the home out. It might just be very simple living room set, a very simple bedroom set, like you said, to uh, hopefully evoke a more generalised emotion. Whereas an interior designer, like in your case, will be brought in for a client that may have just purchased the property uh, and they're planning on living in it for, you know, a, a fairly long time, maybe a few years, with the intent maybe to sell or to rent it afterwards. And that'll fall into a brief. So they're probably going to have a much higher budget. The lead times will be much broader. They're wanting to have a much more layered approach and it'd be probably tailored like yourself to a more specific brief to suit the family life. Mm. Uh, there'll be more layering involved. You know, I specialize in turnkey, for example, which is everything right down to cutlery. And interestingly with those cases, a lot of times you'd be surprised how many the, when the property does sell, the new owners will offer to buy the furniture with the house because it looks so finished that they love the whole package and they kind of just want it as it is. And I've had many clients sell most of the furniture 
um, if not all of it. Mm. And, and I can see why. And, and the the project you worked on uh, for us, anyone who has sort of viewed it or stayed there, universally, I say, if I was ever going to get a house like this, this is what I would. This is exactly as I would have wanted it. Yeah, it's it's un, like universal connectivity. I guess that's the attractiveness of of the skills of a. Um, interior designer is to make something which has great utility for all but is still unique enough so it's individualized and personalized to the person who who has put the brief yeah, in yeah and, and that's tough but where a lot of people go wrong when they when they style a property or they bring an interior design is and, it, and it's horses for courses depending on the use of it but for investment property or short-term rental accommodations you want it to be as relevant to as many people as possible. Whereas yep. some people go very, very bespoke and quirky to their particular needs and most people go, I don't want anything to do with it, which can potentially decrease the resale value of it. If you look yep. at a place and say, there's so much work I've got to do undoing yep. what someone else has done. Yes. Uh, so it can be redone in a way which is more universal. Yeah. And it can compromise the value of a property considerably. Yeah. Yep. I think... I'm all about uh, if, a, if a person's bought a house and they're having a, a, an interior designer come through and style, and it is, like you said, incredibly pigeonholed and, and particular to that one person and you can't imagine anyone else liking their particular habits or uh, hobbies, uh, you, a good interior designer should be able to take that brief as, as specific as it, as it may be and give that client the personalized touch that they deserve for their home, but do it in a manner that if, as you said, somebody was going to buy this property in five years and um, it's going to be up on the market, we could easily take some of those furniture items that are specific to this person out for sale. And maybe if pink's their thing and there's a lot of pink in there, we can paint that out in a, a different color palette or um, remove certain aspects very easily without great expense. And suddenly that home is a little bit less, uh, polarizing for a broader market. That's another reason why you would engage an interior designer. I think even more importantly, if you are creating something that's very, uh, tailored and specific. Yeah. And, and, and this is the difference for being a property investor and maybe someone that doesn't invest in property, property investors, inherently, and, and, and I know thousands of them will always be thinking, if it's a, a short-term rental accommodation, what, what works for me, but what's going to work for everyone else and what's going to create more value for me? That's mm -hmm. a property investor is always there. So everything you do with your property should always be about how does it create more value? Now, if you put your, your emphasis on value as in, hey, I really like it and I'm comfortable here and I've got my yin and yang sort of that because I live here in another, that's cool. Mm -hmm. That's how we want to invest, but we're talking to property investors yep. who look to make money through property. Um, so you can get more bang for your buck um, sort of interior design in certain areas. Uh, welcome back, uh, Phil Tarrant from Smart Property Investment, having a chat with Jace Campbell at Found by Jace Campbell. Uh, have you got a URL or an email or a, a website now? Is uh, it found I, by is uh, you can look, I've got Instagram at the moment, which is okay. Found by Jace Campbell, and also my email, which is Jace at Jace. Found by Jace Campbell. Okay, too com. easy. Yep. By, and that's J A S E. E, yep. Jace Campbell. I remember when I first chatting with you, I spelled it with a C. I'm really particular about names. A lot of people I, do, yeah. I hate getting it wrong. But um, <laughs> what, what, how did you end up doing this? Uh, I actually studied uh, at 26. My mum was a, not an interior designer. Uh, my father was a furniture maker. Okay. And uh, mum just was obsessed with changing the house every, or as often as she could. And we mm. were always on tight budgets. So... Mum, unbeknownst to me at the time, I was very young, just kind of instilled this natural love of interiors, working with what you've got. Dad would make whatever we didn't have. Um, they were big on buying old antiques and repurposing them into dining tables. And, uh, you know, mum was fantastic at sewing. She would make the curtains. Dad would upholster a sofa. So I was kind of uh, surrounded by that environment uh, without realising that it was having a bit of a stamp on me through my childhood. It's funny when you look back though, like I was always making houses out of whatever I could, like shoe boxes, Lego, mm. all that sort of thing. So it was kind of there, but weirdly I had a brief <laughs> um, career in media and then it wasn't until 26 that I had a bit of a light bulb moment and thought about interior design and actually could do this for a career. Yeah. 
And as soon as I started studying at 26, I knew straight away it was exactly where I needed to be. I took to it like a duck to water and I absolutely loved it. I adored studying even though I was working full time and that's why I knew this was something that was different to everything mm. else I'd done before. I think uh, interior designers are a lot like great singers. You, you can't teach uh, somebody to sing really well and I'm one of those people. <laughs> Uh, but I think interior designers have a certain eye, um, and that's why there's a lot of great designers out there that aren't actually, um, they haven't studied. They just have a, an immaculate eye. They can walk into spaces and they have clear vision. I think <laughs> I'll probably get shot down for this, but, uh, you should probably walk the other way. If an interior designer ever says, I, I can't visualize because that's really one of the main skill sets of mm. an interior designer. Uh, when I walk into a space as I did with you and your property, I will have a conversation around your brief. We'll be talking, but as we're doing that, I'm like, that room is transforming in front of my very eyes. It's, uh, I'm looking at furniture placement. I'm looking at scale. What can we do? Color palette. It's all happening like a projection in my mind. And I'll often talk about those ideas initially. If something's really standing out to me as, as you and I did about cabinetry changes, mm. Um, thoroughfares, door placements in bedrooms. You know, we were able to make four bedrooms out of two. Uh, you should be able to do that as an interior designer. And that is one of, like I said, one of the greatest skill sets aside from the first biggest. And that is, as I said, listening. Yeah. Listening is key because you can't dictate your, um, preferences on other people, right? That's, no. a, that's the skill of the interior designer is to, to, to create a solution which meets the needs yeah. and the wants of the client, but also with a view towards the long-term um, integrity of the, the asset itself, right? Yes. You, you don't want to be recommending stuff which is going to devalue your property versus yeah. value your property. But, and what, what sort of become clear to me uh, was, um, again, sort of challenging this assumption that um, – interior designers just do one thing and they're really, really expensive and all they do is they tell you to put these blankets down and stuff, which is sort of, it's been hijacked. There, there is a real utility of it. Mm. You need to think of interior designer as you would do any other trade or part of the the the, the, the process um, of a build or a renovation or, or preparing uh, something for, um, for auction. But there's so many different parts of it, right? It's just not the visualisation and, mm. hey, we should do it this way. There's there's all the... the pragmatic um, uh, and and bits of work that needs to happen. Like you guys and girls, the interior designers, will go and source the stuff for you and negotiate yep. the items. You'll source the items. You'll negotiate them. You'll all the you do all yep. the, the procurement stuff, which is a big part of it. You Huge. know, you can get access to stuff that you might not get access yes. to if you're doing it yourself. You you will learn about products you don't even know exist yeah. by by doing it yourself. And, and, and to be fair, again, coming back to – the, the purpose of, of property investment as in maximising your, your asset and doing the things and getting the right people to do the stuff better than you can. Um, I'm not doing my own tax. I'm not doing my own conveyancing. I'm not doing my own buying use buyers agents. I'm not doing my own mortgages, right? Like you should be spending the right money with the right experts to do the right stuff. Mm -hmm. It's more time effective, but also it's a hassle. I couldn't think of anything worse yep. than driving around to furniture stores looking mm. – and speaking to salespeople for stuff I don't know yes. I really need. Well, it actually, you know. it plugs into what we, t we spoke about earlier about misconceptions, a little like the layering process and how people sometimes think, oh, I can I can do that. Procurement's actually quite similar. Uh, I've had to kind of try and convince people in several instances that, you know, it, it's going to drive you crazy. It's, it's going to be far more time efficient mm. and way less stressful if you just get me to project manage this. And there was one instance last year where uh, a client very was adamant about managing that themselves. And within three weeks, I was engaged to take that over because it was stuff was arriving randomly, flat packed, not not assembled, um, and it was just kind of getting out of control for that person. And it, it became very evident for them very quickly that this is beyond me. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I don't have the time for this. And so I was then kind of engaged. Do you it. actually enjoy, do you, do you, cause personally, I can't think of anything worse, right? Um, running around spending days and days and days in 
furniture stores or or um I don't even know what you call them, places where you buy knives and forks and glasses yep. and stuff like that. Like you 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 it's a it's a real profession, it's an art. Doing it is. That really well, it's well. actually one of the reasons why I called my business found. Yeah. Uh one of I I'm a bit of a freak like that. One of my skill sets is finding and not just finding uh what is required for the job, but going kind of a, a whole step, a whole level further than you know most people probably do in finding uh, very specific vintage finds, mm. uh, one-off pieces, uh, things with stories for each project, no matter what that is. Um, I worked on a very large project last year for uh, Kalani Keeney doing their head office and warehouse, which was amazing. And as you can imagine, it was very bright, very colourful, really a, a great uh, opportunity for myself to be free with colour and um, in ways I'd never done before. And I had a great time um, procuring not just what was required for the job, but really obscure items that gave that uh, building um, a very clear brand for their brand without having logos splashed all over the place. There was actually no logos printed anywhere. It was really important in that particular job that the interiors spoke to the brand and they did in the end. And that was because I spent a great deal of time procuring and finding um, new items, bespoke items, vintage finds. There was a great nod to mid-century and retro. So I was able to, you know, go thrifting and, and um, op shop finding for all sorts of so random items. So a great items. day out for you is go... Well, there's probably op, several op, weeks. Op shopping. Yeah, but sorry, but you go like, yeah, and, and uncovering, like you actually get great satisfaction it, out, yeah. of, out of uncovering Absolutely, something. because it sets you so apart. Like, and when you get that photograph, there's a large part of procurement is it's the final step. So mm. it is fun and it's also a lot of work, but it's good for an interior designer to be in charge of that process because in many ways it's the end, the last chapter of the book on that job. It was, you know, probably nine, 10 months in the making. And so to be able to project manage that very tightly and complete those rooms with the furnishing, with the layering, um, artworks, all of it, it's quite important that you're there regularly and um, you're there styling it, you're styling it for the photography, yeah. uh, all of that. It gives you a greater amount of control, not just to please the client and get them the best results, but uh, it's a project you're very proud of. So you want obviously to have um, have it look the best that it can be. So you do, as well as residential stuff, which we're talking about, you do commercial stuff as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And imagine they're different disciplines as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, in the case of Kalani, their brand is incredibly bold and dynamic. It's mm. much younger. It's very fun, really punchy. So you get this uh, extra layer of creativity where you're challenged to inject that uh, ever so smartly and um, thoughtfully into the interiors, whereas a residence is about a space you live in, not the one yeah. that you work in. So it has a different discipline to it. Um, of course, there's interiors where you might be lucky to be that playful and that colourful. Uh, but I learnt a lot just off that one project around uh, things that you can do to just be creative in ways you never imagined. So if you've made the decision to invest in a, um interior designer, yep. um, When's the best time to make that? Say if you're building a, a place, you probably want it pretty early on during the, during the, the design phase. The preference is always early, mm. but it's never ideal. Yeah, It's really rare that you can get in front of a client uh, at the point the architectural plans have just been approved and we've got the green light. That's the best case scenario, but it's really rare and it's always different. Mm. You know, the brief is always different. The person is always different. The circumstance is always different. In the case of... Kalani Kini again, the build had just begun when I was brought on board. So I actually, in that very specific instance, didn't get an opportunity to present the holistic scheme because the builder was requiring drawings so fast as he hit each space that I had to issue those drawings as we, were, as we went oh along. And that was a whole level of project management that not even I had uh, experienced before. But you just find a way. You need to make sure that... It's, I imagine not a good stakeholder management, right? It's just not the client, but it's 
managing the builder, I imagine, probably its own it's, challenging thing. Who's got yeah. the reviews are going, why would you want to do that? Or I don't really understand the detail or yep. all this sort of stuff. Yeah, you've got to have a great relationship with builders. And, and a lot of times they can get frustrated because they have a different set of priorities. They, they want to build and they want to get it done and they want to get it done quickly mm. so they can move on to the next project. And I totally understand that. So then you have an interior designer and what causes a little bit of friction sometimes is the interior designer is looking at detail. So uh, we were able to catch a lot of issues early as I, cause I was going there regularly and, and project managing, but we're also looking really closely at, could this be done better? Is this correct? Um, and you know, we we're fortunate with the builder on that job. They were really accommodating, but yeah, it can, it's a bit of a juggling act cause you have to respect what they're there to do, that they have a job to complete and that mm. they're trying to do it, uh, as fast as possible. And that you coming in saying, actually, no, this is wrong, or uh, actually we need to change this now and make this door this door height higher. As much and all as it's for the client's benefit, it's you know then the builder has to kind of work in with that. And but people some like variations if they can avoid it, and that's that's fair enough. So yeah. catching it in the front end is really good. So so you made a decision to to engage a um, uh, interior designer. How do you be the best? Um, customer you can be. So uh, how do you how do you give them the bandwidth they need for them to, to be able to do the most effective job they can do without stifling them, but not giving them too much where you may lose control of the outcome. They must, yep. It's a fine balance. It is a fine balance. Fortunately for me, in a lot of my jobs, clients, like trust is the most important thing. Mm. And it's in most cases, I've been really lucky, like with you and Victoria, uh, there was a great level of trust where you trusted me from point of presentation. I was able to deliver that and, and really um, walk you through what the home would be. And from that point, you, I think the trust was pretty, pretty yeah. good. And the collaboration was equal. So all through that journey, we had communication uh, and you were able to ask questions and be part of that journey rather than completely just letting me go off. I think problems arise where people can't let go. So it's kind and again, I bring it back to working with a trade. If a trade, if an electrician is, is standing over the dining table and they're installing a chandelier, you don't stand under them telling them how to install the chandelier and how to wire it because they're an electrician. You just naturally trust that they're a trade and that they know what exactly what they're doing. And it is a little bit like that with an interior designer. Of course, there's collaboration always. Uh, and you can certainly uh, talk and, and um, talk about your concerns and all that sort of stuff. But you do need to respect that they're there to do their job properly. Um, if you've engaged and you've gone past that point of presentation and you're now into the project, that their job is to actually foresee that and bring it to life. They're not working against you. Mm. Uh, so I think, yeah, trust is probably the, the greatest And, and you've got to, yeah, I, I actually agree. And, and before we engage you in this project, we sort of spoke to some other people and they're all good, you know, some very good interior designers around. But much like a mortgage broker or, or your buyer's agent, you've got to like them as well, right? Yes, like you're not going to like everyone, right? And it, it has to be a relationship of trust because you need to trust in their, their professional capabilities, but you've also got to enjoy the process as well. If you don't like Absolutely. interior design, you're not going to have, you're not going to have a good experience. Exactly. I, That's I could not agree with yeah, that more. You need a shared goal and yes. a shared outcome and because a shared objective. It comes down to communication again. Mm. If there's a, some sort of unspoken rift, not everybody gets on with everybody, let's be honest. Mm. And you will usually be able to pick that up pretty early in that process. So if you are about to sign off and you're noticing that you feel uncomfortable making changes or you don't feel like there's an open dialogue, you either need, you, you must address that yeah. or you must start looking for something else because uh, it's just going to corrode from there. You should have a really good rapport with someone pretty much instantaneously. And there will be plenty of options to work that out before you're signing on the dotted line and that, that green button's been pushed. Yeah. So that's up to you to manage how you're feeling with that interior designer. Uh, and it's likewise with a client. If a client says to me, oh, um, we've engaged several interior designers and we've never had one that we've 
gelled with. You run the that's, other I way. I run yeah. a mile. Run, run yeah. Like it's just a very bad sign, typically speaking. Yeah. But you, but you find that with all trades. People, yeah. like, people love to complain about their builder. Yeah. I don't know anyone, like any any sort of, you see people getting randos all the time. Everyone always complains about their build until the job's done. They're like, oh, they were great. They were great, yeah. They <laughs> always complain about it. They take it too long. They're this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. People like to complain about tradespeople. Yeah. It's just, it's just the way it is. So when, when you actually do, and, and, and I think of people I use for a whole bunch of different things now, property related, like when, when you get good partners, you've got to keep them. Mm. Like, and, and it's just not the the uh, the functional aspects of, of property investment, whether it's you know, mortgage brokers or lawyers or accountants and other, it's the other side of it. It's, yep. it's people who do the stuff, right? The tradies. Yep. And you need to remember with, a, with the interior designer, you might not necessarily be able to see how a wall is built, but I tell you what, you've got to see every single day what your place looks like. Mm. And I'm just conscious of, of time, but where, where's the best, best place to get bang for your buck when you're doing um, interior designer? If you want to maximize a property for the purpose of selling it or, mm-hmm. or increasing as rental appeal, where would you spend your money? Uh, I would engage an interior designer if you're going to be there for a, a period of time yourself, mm. um, just to see what their take on things is. And then obviously if you're looking at a property stylist, I would get at least three quotations and see what they're offering and what their initial reactions are to the property. One thing that I will say that I see mistaked often is uh, the wrong property styling in particularly the higher the price and the wrong photography. Mm. And I really don't understand it. If anyone's listening and you don't believe me, flick on to realestate.com and look through three homes. Um, you'll find one pretty quickly where the furnishings are bad enough that they're distracting from the actual property that you're looking at. I saw one as an example recently, um, a two bedroom apartment overlooking Albert Park Lake. Now it was somewhere around 3 million and this place was actually styled really well, but the florals that they'd used were very dead Mm. and lifeless. That's one thing you never see. Like just spend $500 on putting good florals in. They had gone to the expense of a good video, really good video. And fairly good photography, but you've got dead plants and, you know, really crappy looking flowers on your kitchen bench. That's just not to to me at that price point, not acceptable. Just Mm. spend $500 and put good florals in. And then you've got a walk-in robe that we would deem hotel luxe. It's got beautiful glass doors on everything. So you can see the interiors. So this is what someone would want a little boutique style wardrobe. So you've got clothes hanging up, which is all fine. And for this particular photo, you've got a duvet stuffed Mm. into the wardrobe. It's glass doors. So we see it all balled up and it's pushing the shirts up. And I'm like, just take it out for the photo. You know, you're you're selling this property. You've gone to that level. Just take it out. And don't just be absent and expect someone to do it for you because the photographer may not think to do that. Yeah, photographers are going to do it. I remember when when we were getting this this property you worked on with us ready for styling photography, so we could like list it for short term rental accommodation, all that sort of stuff. I remember you called me up and said, "Phil, man, I'm not happy with your your duvets. Yeah. You know, they're just come on. Yeah, you know, they're okay, but you're like, nah, it's just just not right. And no. I think you you said, look, I got to go out and buy new new, new duvet, bedding. new bedding, yep. yeah, new covers and dunas by yep. I think by memory, and I just went. Why? And you said this reason. I went sure. Yeah, do it. So you got to trust. You got to. It's creating trust. a lifestyle. Yeah, right. you got to trust your your interior designer. Um, you know, What's spending. The point? I remember like you you bought a pie to put in a any kind of clock thing. What's that thing you with a glass thing? The you know, the cloche. Clock, cloche, whatever. <laughs> it's like I, I would never have thought about that sort of stuff. But it makes yeah it, for I the mean, purpose of styling. It's, it's yeah. I mean, cool. with your interior, we had a mix of. Um, like uh, interior shots mixed with lifestyle shots. Mm. The lifestyle shots were really important. It's showing not only the interiors, but how you might like to use these interiors. So instead of just shooting the dining table empty and, you know, um, a bit barren, a bit naked, uh, we dressed that 
fully dressed it so someone's about to sit down there with 10 people and have an amazing experience. Yeah. You've gone to the expense of dressing bedrooms. Well, why wouldn't you dress the bed? The bed is sensational, but it doesn't look good right now because Mm. it's just got an old, you know, doona on there with a couple of cushions. And that's a mistake like many people overlook for some reason. Yeah, it's just those small things you don't see. You don't don't see if you don't look for it. Um, And and I, I think about the styling yeah, and, and again, styling is, is key and it's got to be styled for a particular purpose. You know, we, we got styling photos taken for the purpose of being able to list it on, on short-term uh, rental accommodation sites. If I had my time again, because I got videos done as well, oh, I think that the photos were nice, but the, the, what the videos lacked was was people. You know, I, I, yeah. I think if I had my time again, I would have somehow injected, not me because I yeah. would have been a video, but you, you would – you would actually to give this sort of sense of livability. Yep. You know, you'd actually like how how is someone connecting with the space rather than just being a really really nice space. Yeah, you know, like and this is this is the key. I think if you know. anytime you've got a pool in particular, yeah, uh, or a spa, um, even just having it running and 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 get capturing Something the happening. bubbles and yeah, yeah that sort of thing again it plugs right back into lifestyle. It's an emotional. Oh, I could really see myself there. Yeah. That really appeals to me. I, I want to rent it, or I want to buy it, or I want to stay there. Um, how you and, and it's gaining popularity. Finally, it's taken a long while for videography to kick off with properties. Mm. I'm surprised how long it's taken because videography can be expensive if it, if you want a full scale production. But it, my God, does it show you a property in a completely different light to photography? The other thing I would warn people against is just allowing the realtor to do photography. Um, there's always budgets and I'm totally respectful of that. So do what you can afford, but you've gone through the journey of having a professional photographer come in to shoot a house and it's apples and oranges. And if you're setting a premium price for a property, then that property deserves to be showcased accordingly. Mm. And it's taking a while for people to cotton on to that. I don't know if it's because pricing in Sydney has been so good for so long that they just assume they'll get their best price with minimal input. But they kind of forget about the fact that Bob got $4 million next door, so I'm going to get $4 million for mine, so I'll just sell it. Yeah. Uh, without realising that if I do some really great photography, uh, style this appropriately... And I might get five million, four and a half million, You're even. I'm not going to know. Like, yeah. Why and, wouldn't and this, you try? So this needs to be the return on the investment of 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 an interior designer, and 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 why you're getting an interior designer. You know, um, uh, are you getting it for the purpose of creating a home that you want to live in and be super functional? Or are you creating it for the purpose of selling a property or, or making it more rentable? So again, it comes back to the objective, and a good interior designer will be able to understand what you're trying. Uh, to achieve and, yeah. and therefore create a solution which is consistent with that. It's not, it's not one size fits all with no. interior designs. Oh, Absolutely not. not. There, there's, 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 there's basic fundamentals which are probably universal for everything, but yeah. the uh, objective and the outcome is always different. So you're on, the, you're on the same team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you know if your interior designer is a good interior designer? I'll conclude with that. I think it definitely goes back to, like you said, rapport. Just rapport. Yeah, yeah. I, I always treat my clients like. Uh, really good friends. Mm. And uh, in every case, by the end of that journey, you are really good friends. You become um, quite close because you're in contact so regularly. It is a real privilege of the job to be able to go into someone's home, anybody's home, and help them uh, design it for their life. Yeah, And I've always been very respectful of that. Uh, and through the co- natural course of that evolution, you do create fantastic relationships with people that last not just for the duration of that project, but most of my work now exists through um, ongoing um, projects with those same people. A lot of them are, like yourself, investors. They will have different um, commercial sites or residential yeah. sites that they're doing. The next project. The next project. The next project, which, which is a good way to operate. And you know, I, was, I was happy to bring Jason onto the podcast um, uh, and and – you know, by by no, you 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 get what you pay for with within with interior design yes, and like anything, yep. and uh, and and depending on the size, scope, and scale of the project, it's going to be variable how much it costs. But um, 
I, I would say that it's probably some of the best money I've spent is actually engaging someone to do this because the outcome is much better than what I would have been able to achieve. But, you know, so I'm happy to bring you in and have a chat about this because um, mate, you come highly regarded and recommended from me. Thanks. Phil. Um, uh, and it was, uh, I enjoyed the process. I, I personally learned a lot from it and I'm very happy with the outcome. So, yeah, you I'm know. Pleased. Happy to bring you on and have a chat. Yeah, if anyone wants to fun. find Jace, don't make him too busy because I want to use him again <laughs> uh, for something. Foundbyjacecampbell.com.au. I'm happy to give you a plug. Normally I wouldn't do it, but uh, um, enjoy being in business by yourself now. I love it. Yeah? I love being my own boss. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I've worked for people my whole life, but yeah, there's just something about running your own business that's just freeing and um, I think I'm actually able to do my job a lot better now that I call the shots within that, mm. that brand. Uh, yeah, I adore it. But don't take over the world too quickly. Yeah, there's a lot of properties out there. <laughs> yeah, not, not a bad spot. But uh, <laughs> so F-O-U-N-D by J-A-S-E-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. That's it. Com. If you have any problems tracking them down, just contact the team here, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Happy to give you an intro. Uh, Jace, keep at it, mate. Thanks, Phil. It's good to see you. We'll speak soon, I'm yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and a lot, you know, again, um, the, the the key outcomes of this discussion for me is probably two in particular. Number one, you need to uh, have an understanding of appreciation of the investment uh, in an interior designer and, and, and what the upside benefit for you is. And that will be depending completely on what you're trying to achieve. So even if you just want to get sounding board, uh, have, have a discussion with an interior designer. The second one is to maybe reframe and reshape your attitude towards an interior designer. They are a tradesperson. They are part of that um um, sequence of um, the team. project delivery in the team uh, and in many ways your interior designer might be able to maximise your investment more than other trades so again have a chat with your interior designer and no doubt just have a chat with you and remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au social media Smart Property HQ is where you find us we'll see you next time until then bye bye the information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.